Good afternoon, everybody, and I hope you are enjoying being able to go to the hairdresser and various other places. This week, um, as you can see, it's not happened to me, but um, I hope it's been something that has given you a little optimism for what lies ahead um, in so many different ways. And uh, I'm very glad, especially for those businesses who can now start earning the living again. I notice there's people sitting outside cafes and pubs around the town, which always seems to be good. So as I said to you a few weeks ago, I want to spend some time over the next few weeks talking to you about the history of SPAND and also about how we do what we do. One of the things that you often find is people tell you things, but they don't tell you how they do it. And that always irritates me. So I'm going to talk to you about how SPAN came about in the first place, which, which will take two or three weeks. And then I'm going to tell you about how we do what we do and why it is different from anybody else. I hope that's going to be um, enlightening. So this has been my life's work spanned and continues to mean such a lot to me and I also believe as I said to you last week that it charts the way for the future in the church in many respects but before we do that um, I want to pay a, a special word of tribute to uh, a warm and loving priest Father Owen O'Neill who died last weekend, only six months after he retired as the parish priest of Market Harbour. Now, apart from being a very kind and remarkable person, caring and thoughtful, Father Owen was pivotal, actually, in the development of SPAND for two main reasons. At the end of 1978, when I arrived in West Bridgeford, he was the director of the then Catholic Children's Society, which was actually in the parish. And... I used to pop and see him, as he said to me, call in any time. And one day he said to me, do you have any base to do your work for our special friends? And I said, well, it's in my bedroom. And he said, well, that's not good enough. He said, you can have an office here. And the provision of an office in the Catholic Children's Society was absolutely crucial. Um, we had a, access to a photocopier, a phone, we had somewhere we could store things, where people could meet. Um, it effectively became my home. And Father Owen, being the man that he was, actually gave me the key to his own home up in Harrington Drive. He so said, if you need to have your family come any time or some friends, you know, take them over there. He was a man of the most incredible generosity. So that was the first thing that was pivotal about what he did. And the second thing was when he went to Leicester as parish priest of John Bosco, he built a lovely little church and um, invited the newly formed Leicester group to come and have their meetings in the hall there. And um, that's what they've been doing. And when we you know, get together, that's what they still do. And from that day to this, on the first Sunday of Advent, the whole of Span has gathered at St John Bosco Church to have our Advent Mass. So it's, uh, it's a very special place. And all of that is down to Father Owen and so much more. So we, we think of him with great respect and honour and we pray for his peace. He deserved a longer retirement, bless him, it wasn't to be. So uh, dear, dear brother, thank you for what you've done for us and for so many other people and, and rest in peace. But just in case you don't know, SPAND stands for supporting people with additional needs in the Nottingham Diocese. It took us 25 years to come up with that acronym. Uh, we were doing all sorts of things first, and it was invented by Simon Brittle and Barbara Drummond, and has proved a very happy way of um, describing what we do, not only uh, as, as a word, but it also recognises a bridge, a span of a bridge, so that um, people who previously might have been uh, on the edges of things have now a bridge to be part of normal life as society and church. And it's hard for many people who don't have long memories to imagine what it was like 60 years ago. The language we used for people with disabling conditions was different. 
and the whole concept of their being an integral part of society, living and contributing to the life of us all, was a very distant prospect. We think of that now with horror, but like so other many things at that time, no one seemed to regard it as strange. People with learning difficulties were officially classified as subnormal or severely subnormal. Um, ESNM and ESNS, as it was called. Many were locked away in the so-called mental handicap hospitals and some in full-blown psychiatric hospitals. They were kept away from our thoughts and our gaze and rarely, if ever, to be seen in public again. Many children went to isolated special schools um, or were cared for by their own families, which put a great strain on them, particularly if they had challenging behaviour and medical conditions. It was a life of isolation and marginalisation, of loneliness and lack of support, which, I have to say, sadly, was in no way helped by the church, an organisation which is supposed to care for everyone, especially those with special needs and difficulties, whatever they may be. Our language was patronising. We taught, we used the word handicapped, spastic, mongols, cripples, crazy, retarded, crackers, and many others. And they were often used as insults when you wanted to insult someone, you're, you're a right spastic, you are. And spasticity is a stiffening of the joints caused by a condition called cerebral palsy. Um, it was not an insult. And later on, of course, we, we got into political correctness and tried to smooth over all this uh, and completely failed um, because we, we, we started talking about people as differently abled or disadvantaged. And it was a miserable failure. I had a, a wonderful friend called Kathleen Archer, uh, a very strong lady who had multiple sclerosis and brought up four girls all on her own. And she used to shout at people, don't call me differently abled, I'm disabled and proud of it. Later on, it would be Kathleen who, after several overnight 26 Trent walks, as our secretary, with me pushing her along the streets of Nottinghamshire for 275 miles, it was she who set up a charity for disabled people, run by disabled people themselves, and was awarded the MBE for it, and I duly took her to the palace to collect the, the same gong. And in those days, the Catholic Church's solution to the matter of disability was to take people with disabling conditions to Leward so that they might be cured. And um, there was never any problem in raising funds. You could go into a pub and say, I'm taking this child to Leward. You get the money almost straight away. People coughed up willingly often out of guilt or misplaced sympathy or pity, and would often justify their generosity by saying, well, of course, at least all my children are healthy. Um, what does that mean about the others? So imagine the furore then in, when in 1977, one of our first published documents called Guideline 77 Notes for Priests and Pastoral Workers, I suggested that, quote, lured was not enough. We needed to be asking what we were doing all year round to involve and include people with disabilities in our life and work. Uh, this document got published nationally in a publication called Briefing and found its way into the Irish independent newspaper under the misquoted byline Priest says we shouldn't go to Leward. Um, this was the first of rather a lot of run-ins with the media for me, most of which you will be well aware of, of course. No one ever asked what life was like for families whose children were disabled, or for a disabled adult, largely because these people were out of sight, hidden away in their homes or in the institutions, so that most people hardly ever knew that they existed at all. And some years ago, the disabled writer, Louis Batty, put this experience beautifully into words in his book, which was called The Chatterley Syndrome. The cripple is an object of Christian charity, a socio-medical problem, a stumbling nuisance, an embarrassment to the girls he falls in love with, he is a vocation for saints, a livelihood for the manufacturers of wheelchairs, 
a target for busybodies, a means by which prosperous citizens assuage their consciences. He is at the mercy of overworked doctors and nurses and underworked bureaucrats and social investigators. He is pitied, ignored, helped and patronised, misunderstood and stared at, but he is hardly ever taken seriously as a man. More than this, sometime later in 1987, a remarkable young Irishman called Christopher Nolan, who was 15, totally disabled, unable seemingly to speak, move or communicate, wrote the most amazing book I have ever read, which is called Under the Eye of the Clock. His perceptive mother saw something in him that he couldn't express, and so she devised a means of his doing so by getting a belt which she placed around his head, put a hole in the front of it to which she attached a knitting needle and on the end of the knitting needle she put a thimble, a rubber thimble. She then held his head in her cupped hands over an electric typewriter as he typed the words of a novel, painstakingly, letter by letter, word by word, sentence by sentence. And in so doing, created this incredible story about what it is like to be disabled, creating a work of such literary quality that any prize winner would be exceedingly proud of. And in it, he said the following, Can I climb man-made mountains? Can I mount socially constructed barriers? Can I ask my family to back me when I know something more than they? What can a speechless, crippled boy do? My handicap curtails my collective conscience, obliterates my voice, beckons ridicule of my smile, and damns my chances of being accepted as normal. Will they be able to gauge my terrible struggle? Can any sane, able-bodied person sense how it feels to have evil intention limbs constantly making a mockery of you? How can they hear your cry for life? And can I, crippled as I am, spearhead a new drive to highlight the communicative needs of tongue-tied but normal-notioned man? For any boy of 15, those sentences would be incredible. But for Christopher Nolan, it's simply, simply amazing. And in those days, Nobody knew these things, or seemingly even cared. Out of sight was truly out of mind. But then a number of factors came together in different places to change our perceptions dramatically, with the vision and commitment of some great people whom I wish to single out now. Leonard Cheshire, a soldier, who after the war saw the plight of those injured and maimed returning home limbless, traumatised and disabled for life, many of whom were even deserted by their own families and forced into poverty or to live begging on the streets, brave men who had served their country and were repaid with degradation and humiliation. Cheshire set up homes in his name all over the world for them, where they could be cared for with dignity for life if necessary. And his wife, Sue Ryder, did something similar. It was a wonderful vision. Ludwig Gutmann, a Swede, who saw the need for providing facilities for people with disabilities, and not only did he found the Stoke Mandeville Hospital for people with spining, spinal injuries to be treated and rehabilitated, but also made rehabilitation his goal in so many different ways, both in his own country and, in, and here. Jean Vanier, a French-Canadian naval officer and university lecturer, went into a long-stay hospital near Paris and saw the situation and conditions in which many of the patients were living. He was appalled at their lack of dignity. This led him to invite two men to come and live with him in a small community which he called Larche, the Ark. And now there are such communities all over the world where people live, work and pray together in great happiness. 
It was also Jean Vanier who, with a friend, Marie-Hélène Mathieu, who created the first Faith and Light pilgrimage to Lourdes in 1971, at which 3,000 people with learning difficulties and their families came to celebrate their Faith and Light together. It was a pivotal moment in that nothing like this had ever happened before, and it gave rise to other such events, pilgrimages and so on, as it became an international movement which still flourishes today. And because of faith and light, people with learning difficulties were brought out into the light and into the church community, which for so long had failed them, and the possibility of respect, inclusion and involvement was born. Sister Jean Daniel was a visionary and is a visionary nun living in Bristol who began going into a long-stay mental handicap hospital, as it was called, to teach our faith to some of the patients, creating her own style and content, which was very well received. And again, what was so remarkable about that was that it had never happened before. Father David Wilson, a gentle, wise priest in the Diocese of Westminster, took this work a stage further and created, with Sister Stephanie Clifford, St. Joseph's Centre in Hendon, a specially equipped facility in an old convent for the spiritual formation and inclusion of children and young people with learning difficulties, of which he was the director for some years before going to live and work in a large community near Boulogne in France, where he remains. Father David also published regularly a document called Document Cap to keep the church in this country abreast in the developments in catechesis and pastoral care for our friends. John and Audrey Williams, whose son Hugh developed meningitis shortly after he was born and spent all of his 29 years needing care and support provided almost exclusively and with great respect and dignity by his mother. When he was 10, they took him to a priest in his native Wales to ask if Hugh could make his first Holy Communion, only to be told, well, not really, you see, because it would be like giving it to a dog. It's amazing, isn't it? Some years later, their new, new curate in West Bridgeford would come every Friday morning, help his mother to get Hugh up for Holy Communion, which he received reverently from his mother's hands, a gesture that filled her with joy. It was John and Audrey who, with a lady called Elizabeth Fitzroy, would set up the Fitzroy homes for people with intellectual and physical disabilities so that they could live in a community of love together. And they also established what came to be called the Catholic Handicapped Children's Fellowship, which devoted its efforts to visiting families of people with disabling conditions to support them at home and take them on outings in the summer and have parties at Christmas. Two such groups existed in our diocese in Derby and Leicester from as long ago as the early 1960s. And two of the original members, very young ladies at the time, Barbara Drummond and Jenny Hickey, would become, unknown to themselves, the precursors of SPAND, in which they are both still very actively involved today. And finally, Maureen McCoy, an outrageous Irish Brummie nurse, who was the district nursing sister, working nights in the Birmingham, putting people to bed and giving the necessary injections to dying people in their homes. She was a woman of great passion and deep faith, which led her to set up the Happy Wanderers, a group of families whose children had learning and physical difficulties. Mrs. Mack, as we called her, gathered them together for masses and parties, mainly at St. Anne's Church in the Bull Ring in the middle of Birmingham, and she took a plane full of people to Leward every Easter week for a joyous and deeply moving time together. Of course, she needed help. So she persuaded her friend, Hugh Sinclair, to enlist that help from a number of seminarians at Oscott College with him. And so it was that on Easter Saturday, 1972, in an old minibus, 
a group of us left Birmingham immediately after the Easter Vigil, slept on a convent floor somewhere in the middle of France, and drove to Lourdes to meet the pilgrims when they arrived on the Monday morning and work with them for the week. I was completely taken aback by what I saw. The sheer volume of pain and distress endured by these families, and yet the wonderful joy that they exuded. We took our guitars, even though most of us couldn't play them properly, and joined the newly formed Smiley Band to play in public one night after the torchlight procession in front of 20,000 people in the Esplanade in Leward. And we played a song that no one had ever heard of before called Give Me Joy in My Heart, Keep Me Praising, um, which got the most rapturous reception. So to this day, that was and remains my biggest ever gig, if you like. On the Thursday of that memorable week, having spent time with our new friends and their families, listening to them and hearing some of their stories and their sense of rejection by God and his church. We were standing in the square during the Blessed Sacrament procession, listening to the words of Saint Martha. Lord, the one whom you love is sick. At that moment, in my heart, I came to a decision that would change everything for me forever. I vowed I am going to give away my life for these people. And that was the beginning of my journey and effectively the beginning of Spand as well. <laughs>